Hello, Play the Game family. Welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us. This episode is brought to you by our absolute favorite guy when it comes to taxes, David Roque. Uh, David is an accountant and paintball player from South Florida. He did all of our PTG and personal taxes last year, and I got to say, David is the man. He's been filing personal and corporate taxes for seven years, has clients all around the United States, so it doesn't matter where you're at. He will figure out the best way to maximize your personal or corporate returns. Um, He's really attentive, really easy to get a hold of, and amazing to work with. His goal is to help provide the paintball community with an affordable accountant that can help you better maximize your personal and corporate returns. Just mention you play paintball or listen to the podcast and he will hook you up uh, with a nice deal to get your taxes done for under $175, which if you compare that to like H&R Block and all the other uh, big services, that's pretty damn good. And again, he's a paintball player. We love supporting the paintball community. The community has really showed up and showed out. So uh, we like to do the same. Like I said, David has made our experience with tax season uh, really seamless, really effortless, and everything is done very efficiently. So if you guys need any tax help, do not hesitate. Make sure to hit up David Roque either via his Instagram, which is alpha underscore Roque 97. That's R-O-Q-U-E and the numbers 97 or by email at droke 954 at gmail.com. Again, that's D as in David, Roque, R-O-Q-U-E, 954 at gmail.com. All right. This episode is brought to you by Lone Wolf Paintball. They are an amazing online supplier and have been around since the beginning of the game as Michigan's premier paintball field and paintball supplier since 1987. They are rapidly expanding into the online retail space and supplying everything you need to be the best paintball player you can be. They have got it all. Head over to LoneWolfPaintball.com and shop all of your favorite brands. And they also boast amazing customer service and will have this out to you with same day shipping, which is amazing. It's always nice to know that your stuff is on its way immediately so you can start to use it that very next week in a play. Check out their YouTube, Lone Wolf Paintball, and their Instagram, at Lone Wolf PB, and stay up to date with all of their deals and sales. Play the Game Podcast is immensely honored to have them on board, and we cannot wait for you guys to check out LoneWolfPaintball.com and become a part of their community. This episode is brought to you by Sunday Paintball. Sunday Paintball is one of the most amazing brands in the business right now. Their whole mission is to be the Tom Shoes of paintball and give players more Sundays. What does that mean exactly? They are donating 50% of all of their profits on any of their things right back into the game to the players, to you, to you guys that are listening right now. How exactly do they do this? Well, you could head over to their website, sundaypaintball.com. They have a tracker of how much money they have and will continue to give away and uh, what they do is they they set up booths at events, they give out paint to teams, they give out, you know, uh, donations and gift certificates to different fields. They do a amazing job of giving back to the community that we all love, and it's really special. It's something that is very unique. We are incredibly appreciative and supportive of them because their passion is to help grow the sport. So if you guys could head over to sundaypaintball.com, check out any of their merchandise. They have so much cool stuff on their website. Um, you can use code play the game, get a 20% discount and do a great thing by uh, knowing that some of that money is going back to getting more players out to play on Sundays. Today's episode of PTG is brought to you by Transfuse, the amazing premium rapid hydration multiplier and immunity fortifying formula that is scientifically designed to replenish you at the cellular level. And they use all natural ingredients in their products. It is packed full of zinc, vitamin B6, vitamin C, sodium, potassium, and choline. And when you take this product, you are going to feel the difference on and off the field. I know that playing paintball with Transfuse has been a game changer, and it will be for you as well. If you head over to translabs.com, that's T-R-A-N-Z-L-A-B-S.com, and use code PLAYTHEGAME, you will get 10% off. And if you subscribe to a monthly delivery service, you get an additional 10% off. So you can take advantage of a total of 20% off on these amazing products. Also, head over to 
their Instagram at transfuse.official and check them out and be on the lookout for their new flavors and brain booster nootropics that are coming soon. We absolutely love Transfuse from top to bottom, one of the best companies in the world with the greatest people running it. So head on over and become a part of their community and check them out. Yo, PTG fam, thank you guys so much for tuning in to the show. This episode, we have Robbie Goldsmith, the head coach of Columbus Level. Uh, they have been on a tear. They've been doing excellent in the pro division. They are a homegrown team uh, without a big budget. They are a group of players that um, you know are best friends and have bought into the program and to the system. Absolutely love what Dave Pando, the owner of the team and the field out in Columbus, Ohio, have been doing. Dave Pando is a longtime friend of mine, and he has just done a dynamite job, both with his field and with this team. So we got to sit down with Robbie and really kind of dissect what has been uh, the turning point for this organization, you know, being on the brink of relegation in previous years. Now they are an absolute threat. They got third place at the last event. So without further ado, we're going to hop in the show. That was an insane inside move by Marcelo Margot. Great communication. And the crowd starts chanting Harmon. Great, great shot by all the guys. So Tyler Harmon saved that game. He came out with two wins. Marcelo Margot was on fire. Ladies and gentlemen, Robbie Goldsmith from Columbus LVL in the building. How are you doing, my man? Shout out to Nashville, Tennessee one time. How's it going over there? <laughs> Love it, man. I am here. I am, uh, I'm excited. Let's do this. There we go. Yeah, man. Thank you so much for coming on the show. It's a great time for uh, Level Up. It's a great time for you as a coach. Um, Pando also let me know there's some pretty exciting stuff you have going on outside of paintball, which is cool. You, you pretty much have just been a dominator uh, <laughs> outside of the sport for a long time. And now it looks like inside of the sport, you're trying to, you know, take Level to the top and be a rock star here too. Yeah. I mean, you know, I was actually thinking about that earlier, like the similarities in, in life between sports and business and, and whatever, it's, it's all the same formula. And, and usually people that are successful at one are successful at the other. So it's, it's kind of, it's fun seeing it come true, you know? Absolutely. Well, thank you for coming on the show, PTG. I know all the listeners out there are super grateful to have your insights and kind of pick your brain on being a top level pro coach. And also like Marcelo said, being involved in so many different facets outside of paintball as well, which I'm excited to get into uh, because you do really live that that grassroots entrepreneurial life and you're just a, a to the core go, go getter. You know what I mean? So we're excited to have you on the show. Um, what is going on with you? Any any news, the uh, fresh, juicy news that we got for PTG listeners out there? Yeah, I mean, obviously coming off a third place finish uh, at the Sunshine Open and uh, that was you know, so dope. Like we still, it's, it's still kind of surreal because a never experienced anything like that in my career. Um, and B like seeing the kids hard work come out is huge. And yeah. it's, it's just an entire, it was an entire week and is an entire period of wins for me. So obviously that happened in my personal life. I sold my first business that I started, dude, um, which congratulations. is congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. It's not a huge win financially, but it's a huge win. Like just yeah. of a stepping up and, you know, mentally it's a big win. And then, and then also mm -hmm. launching my newest company, which will launch here in June, um, you know, which is a whiskey, a bourbon whiskey that is, uh, I'm partnered up with Alan Jackson, who's a famous country music celebrity. If you know, yes, who that sir. Is, um, yeah, he's an icon and, uh, Dang. we're launching a bourbon whiskey for him that, uh, we're going to take on the road and be the main sponsor of his tour this fall. And it's going to be epic. So it's like, it, it was a culmination of two weeks of life hitting all new levels, no pun intended. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and yeah, it's been fun. It's been fun for me. It's been fun for Dave Pando and, and all the boys for sure. Well, let, let me be the first to throw out a yee-haw because we're about <laughs> to be drinking some bourbon whiskey. There yeah. we go. <laughs> we will, uh, we will be, I, I've actually already planted some seeds. I think we'll probably do something fun at world cup for it and have You're it around. planting yeah. seeds too. Holy smokes. <laughs> yeah. What don't you do? No, that'd be this sick. crazy. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so it's going to be fun and, uh, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be a busy 2022 for sure. Hell yeah. Yeah. Awesome, man. Yeah. Well, shoot, dude, you guys are definitely, uh, starting off on the right foot. And I just realized too, I don't know why I'm not wearing my level shirt. Shout out to the Vegas golden misfits team. I coach out here on the West coast, but I should have put on my LVL shirt. Um, it's, it's funny. It's kind of conflicting now because, you know, I'd go out there to Pandos field to do clinics for a long time, but now you guys are a direct competition on the pro field, but it's okay. I still support, I still, uh, got a lot of love for Dave Pando, that field, the organization, everything you guys have going on. 
I, I mean, yeah, I think you still uh, probably the biggest fan base of the Midwest for those boys for sure. Um, and I know you're, I know Colton's out there, your protege. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's been fun. It's been really cool. And seeing like, even now after Chicago, seeing the brand of paintball in Ohio and in the Midwest grow has been pretty sick to see, like just on social media and Dave getting requests to come out in the field and practices and all this stuff. Like, that wouldn't have ever happened, you know, if we didn't have the showing in the last couple events. So that's been fun. And it's, and Dave deserves it, man. You guys know he works his ass off at this stuff and uh, it's, it's really cool. He's going to have the best year of his life with level and, uh, and we're stoked to be a part of it. Yeah. I mean, I, you, I've known Dave Pando for, for a long time, um, about 10 years probably. And he's always been one of the hardest working and um, most savvy when it comes to just marketing and how to run. You know, it's funny when I first met him, it was when I signed with the Ironman and he was, uh, I, he did a bunch of different stuff at die, but he was uh, the one that helped me with my contract and he was the main marketing guy. Um, he always had a dream of building a paintball field. I remember we'd have these conversations and it was just always on his mind. You know, that's what he wanted to do was build the best paintball park there is. And, uh, it's amazing to see, like, as it came to fruition, when he moved out to Columbus and then, you know, let me know that he was getting a field and he started getting it up. And the first time that I went out there until now, how much it's grown and developed and everything that he said that he wanted to implement, he has implemented, you know, having a pro team, having, you know, legitimate tournament style fields. He already had the invitational events, you know, they, they're there. I believe the, uh, MSXL has, has had events there, you know, like it, it is absolutely a tournament field, but it also caters to growing the sport and it caters to new players. And he does a great job of getting, you know, high schools and businesses and birthday parties, like all that kind of stuff to get people to come and enjoy paintball for the very first time. So it, it's amazing to watch. I'm a huge fan of Pando. Uh, always have been, always will be. He's got my full support. Love what he's doing out there, obviously. And uh, it's so cool to see the team being a homegrown team doing so well now. Um, you know, and and uh, it's not like it was just one event, right? This is this has been happening since Philly of last year. I think that was the first. Well, when you guys first came to the league, you guys made a statement too, yeah. right? But you guys have kind of been on a roll since Philly to where you really started to, you know, you took down some tough teams in Philly. Was it heat that you beat? I believe it was heat at yeah. the end of the prelims. And that was like, we were zero and seven until that match. And, and we had some inner team drama the night before made a roster change mid event, which I've never done in my 20 years of playing paintball, made a roster change during the event and came out against you guys and against heat and just like, just played out of our minds and it was just one of those games where everything goes right right you just you just feel it and, and the momentum just never stops um and yeah and then it was literally that was the turning point was like waking up that day and saying why not us was there was the mantra and and that's kind of been rolling ever since you know chicago sixth place last year world cup we missed uh we lost to damage in overtime we let a zone down and chad ran down and shot five guys and if we didn't lose that point we made Sunday at World Cup, and then obviously rolling into a third place here. So you're right; it's it's been it's been cool. Robbie, re really quick, what do you mean a roster change? Mid yeah, we just had a we had a little bit of inner team drama that you know teams experience, and, and we you know we had to part ways with a player okay. after wow. the first That's two matches of the Philly event, and uh, a really good friend of mine. But it just wasn't working out, and uh, and I think that really changed the energy of the team. And it was a thing of like, we're not going to, we're not going to put up with shit. The players aren't putting up with shit. We're all here for a common mission. And, and, you know, it, you know, I, it was just one of those things that I didn't want it to happen. No one wanted to happen, but it had to happen. And once it did, it was just like, there was a new energy in the team. And uh, yeah. And that, and that honestly, that's kind of started the train. Yeah. Awesome, man. Um, and, and it definitely has been a train since it seems like the team has just uh, gotten tighter and gotten better. Um, you know, if anybody watched four Sundays, Rainey even kind of explained it about you guys. Well, you know, about not being surprised about you guys, because there's a lot of respect, um, from the top level players level, no pun intended, uh, <laughs> top, top pro players is what I meant to say, not to confuse the listeners, but, um, about when they play your guys' team, because the team is very capable. And, um, I, I definitely want to dive really deep into this part of the conversation of how you guys got to that point, because, um, it's something that a lot of teams can relate to, whether it's divisional teams or teams that are, or players that are aspiring to go pro when you don't have a lot of other high level pros or, or better players in your area, which is exactly the case for, for Columbus level. How have you guys stuck together and gotten, you know, 
to the playing ability that you're able to to play at out there. Yeah, honestly, I mean, that that's the one thing I always think about is like, you know, because every team tries, right? They try to get there, but very few times does it happen and, and happen that quickly. And listen, like Dave called me in 2020. This He called me three weeks before Vegas, the first event. And he goes, hey, do you think you'd be interested? And I just happened to be changing a little bit of career paths. And I was like, yeah, why not? It sounds like fun. If I get to hang out with you all the time and, you know, I've always loved paintball. I've always wanted to be an ambassador of the sport. Let's try it. And my first practice, dude, they flew me into New Jersey. We were playing Revo in 30 degree weather and we <laughs> literally show up at this hotel that I would never stay in in a million years. And I roll into this hotel and never met these guys. It's like one o'clock in the morning. There's like roaches everywhere. Oh and yeah. These kids are just like these literally the most Midwestern kids ever. And I think we went out and played like 70 points that weekend and probably won six. And I'm like, holy shit, what did I get myself into? I'm mm -hmm. like, you know, because I had heard the drama about the pro spot and buying it and all that kind of stuff and, and whatever happened. And Dave explained it to me. But at the end of the day, you know, Dave was like, I think you're the perfect fit to get these kids to follow you. And, you know, I think they'll respect what it is. And then so we had those two practices went in in Vegas, won our first match against the the aftermath of that year. Um, and and then, you know, it was whatever, but it was like, I really was, I told him, I told him all, I told him all, I was like, I was like, y'all aren't very good. Like, this is not, this is not a thing. Like if we want to get better and make a statement in this league, we're going to have to change some stuff real quick. Uh, but honestly, kudos to the boys for just literally believing in it and like having faith and die and Dave and us and, because that that first year, I really was like, you know, and and I knew they had talent because you could kind of see it. You could tell they didn't do bad in semi pro. They had two second place. They had a couple like fourteenths or whatever. So there wasn't any consistency. They didn't really have a coach, but they had some players that I was like, oh, that kid could play if someone could teach him how to play. You know, mm -hmm. um, obviously Danny and Sam are two stunners on each side of the field. It's not a secret anymore. Those kids, everyone knows who they are. Like I, I saw it, I was like, oh, these kids could be good. How how old are those guys? So Danny just got married and his first kids on the way. He is, I believe, 33, maybe. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, I thought they were older. You're over here calling awesome. them kids. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> congratulations, Danny. I know you got yeah, to this. Congrats, yeah. brother. And, and Sam is, uh, I think, 26 or 28. So they're, he's in his late 20s. But yeah, no, I mean, everyone on our team is pretty much adults with jobs and whatnot. But I saw it. I was like, oh, these kids can play a little bit. Um, I think they really just need structure guidance someone who's been there to kind of show the ropes and we just need to grind harder than everyone else you know and really yeah. dig in so you know and, th and that was it and then and, and i kind of started creating rules i was like we don't leave practice until we shoot 100 cases we don't do this until we do this like all these things like making them run before practice making them run after practice cleaning the pits helping with food all this stuff that like creates teamwork right and all that yeah. and these guys that know each other forever all on different divisional teams or whatever and then it's and it just you know like slowly you kind of see the ball rolling a little bit. And, and I'm like, Hey, am I, I always told him, I was like, this is going to be a long, long, long journey. Mm -hmm. This could be five, six years of getting our asses kicked. Oh yeah, for sure. Robbie, where did you learn this structure and guidance from? Like, you know, where CP, did you baby? Shout out to yeah. CP. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, I, I grew up playing on in the CEP organization, which we were, we had a phenomenal run in the divisional series. We were kind yeah. of like one of the first C teams. CEP was awesome. Dude, we, we, and, and, and so I learned it from guys, you guys know, Kevin Fillers and Adam Smith, yeah. old naughty dog guys. They're the ones yep. that taught Zach Wake how to play. They were mm -hmm. our coaches when we were divisional CEP, brought up through the ranks, learned all that structure. And then when we turned pro, uh, we just, we didn't quite have the support and everything we needed to get the players, to get the, to get all the support. It just, it just wasn't there. We never found the right connection. I think the best we ever did was 10th in Dallas mm -hmm. in 2012 or something. Um, but, uh, but, but going through that and then, and then being in pro for five years and you guys kicking the shit out of us for, I learned like through that, like you learn by failure, right. For the most mm -hmm. part. So I'm like, Oh, I kind of knew what not to do, but I also knew, and realistically, we would never build the team that we could. We never had the support. We didn't have a home field. We didn't have a money man. It was a struggle the whole way. And I was like, okay, if I could ever do this right, I would do it completely different. And then I saw Dave and we have one of the biggest fields in Ohio and, and the support of die big time and all that stuff. And I was like, this could happen. Mm -hmm. So you, you saw the vision, man, you saw the vision and 
um, thankfully, you know, you and Dave both were able to build that vision and, and have a really successful relationship. But building that structure and guidance for the team, that takes a lot of effort. And I know a lot of teams go through those struggles, you know, um, what's some advice on how they, a team can effectively build that and then not also, you know, people might not want to be down for that, but that's kind of what you have to sign up for if, if we're going to be a top level team, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I truly don't know if I could coach another pro team. I, I am not an X's and O's guy like some of the cr- pro coaches are. Like Todd is an, a super X's and O. You guys are so good on the field that you just have to have a superior strategy and, and you're going to win 90% of the time. I have a completely different approach where like if you see me in the pits, like I am so mentally trying to hype these dudes to play out of their mind mm-hmm. that knowing the struggles we're going to go against. And then so like I, I'm always been like, so I'm an entrepreneur, right? I'm a builder. I like to build. The minute the team plateaus, I'll probably be like, hey, guys, like, you know what to do now. I'm probably worthless here because that's just like that's what I like to do. So I see the process like I have a vision of, oh, we're here. We can get to here. And these are the things we do. And that's just what comes naturally to me. It always has in business and life and whatever. No Um, way. You're not getting out of this that easy. You're you're stuck with the team forever, (laughs) bud. Yeah, I mean, I know, right? Um, <laughs> no matter yeah, how I mean, good they do, you're still But you're that's it. And, and then, honestly, around. at the end of the day, the, the, the guys need to buy in because we all know, and, and some of you guys are in a little different. Heat's probably not because you got to have a dictatorship at some point. The boys know at the end of the day what happens on the field with our personnel. There's only one guy that calls the shots, and mm-hmm. that's me. And Dave calls the shots with everything with the field and with the sponsors and that. And I call the shots on the field, and they're the Indians. You know, mm-hmm. I'm the chief, they're the Indians that we have a captain on the field. That's great. But when it comes to it, you know, that's it. And, and, you know, that was really a testament to what we learned last year, the X factor match that we lost in Chicago. We almost kind of threw the match away because I said, I'm not going to risk these guys trust. I'm going to stick to our same game plan. And we're going to learn that we can't have the same game plan on Sunday that we had the first, you know, two days of the tournament. So let's just see what happens here. If we get lucky and win, that's great. But if not, we're going to realize Sunday's a whole new level. And I really think that's what did it to us when we beat the Russians last weekend, because we knew we had to change our game plan. We knew what they were going to expect and we had to come out with something different. Um, Yeah. Yeah. So I don't even, I don't know if that answers the question, but man, it's, it's just, you know, I like to build and I see it and I see where we can go. And, and, you know, when it, when it comes time to X's and O's, like, I don't, I don't, I don't have a, I don't have a great memory. I don't really remember points of matches. Even when I played, I only remember a couple of specific things, but I can see where the, I can see where things are going and how trends evolve in everything. And uh-huh. I'm like, okay, these are the moves that need to happen. I'm a lot like you. Like Marcelo remembers every like game from 1990 and he was just born like a couple of years ago. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> I'm kind of the same way, and I got to give mad love to Todd Martinez because with the X's and the O's, that dude is also one of the most just fiery, you know, inspiring dudes on the planet. Um, and it, it takes a nice little balance of both to be a really effective coach, right? You got to obviously you got to put the good play on the board, but you also got to get people, like you said, in the right mind state where we're thinking the right way and really attacking the game in the right way to process everything because it's a uh, you know, paintball is really fickle. It can, it, you know, one second is good. Next second it's not. And you have to be on top of it a hundred percent all the time and really be driving the train that way. And, and every team is different, right? Like everyone's personalities. Like I'm a pretty type a leader. Like I own two businesses. I have employees. So they know it's my way or the highway. And that's just how mm-hmm. it is. Cause I'm the, you know, at the end of the day, I write the checks. But with paintball, it's a little bit different. So I really had to learn from last year to this year. And it really happened right around the Philly event too, is I have to lead with more empathy with these kids because at the end of the day, it's not it's not completely a dictatorship and I'm not the main center of attention here. So when I started changing my coaching style that way, and also I'd never been a pro coach, right? There's only two events the first year. So mm-hmm. and, and we and we got waxed by everyone but aftermath. Those are the only two matches we won. And we all know how terrible that team was. No offense to the guys on it. So it was like, I had to really learn, like, I can't just come in the pits busting heads every time when they're messing up. It's more about, well, why did we mess up and how do we mm-hmm. fix it next time? Because at the end of the day, you're all just out here giving your best, mm-hmm. you know? And so I had to really switch that. And that was a big thing for me last year, this year, I wrote down like my personal goals for the team. What do I want to get better at? And it was the two main things were one, I didn't watch nearly enough film last year. 
because we didn't expect to do how we did. So I went completely unprepared into Chicago finals. And then two is I wanted to lead with more empathy and, and realize that these kids are still there. These, these men are still young in their careers in paintball. And there, we had people on our team that didn't even play paintball when I was a pro. And I was like, they're like, no, I've never heard of you. And I'm like, oh, I don't care about that. But I'm like, that was only like six years ago. Yeah, that's awesome. I love to hear that. And I think that what you said about em- empathy is something that that can be transferred into the real world too. We could use a lot more empathy these days. Um, and it, it goes a long way, you know? And I think that uh, obviously there's a, a fine balance to that, just like there is in everything in life. Uh, but there's definitely a lot of value in it as well. Yeah, I mean, and it's just life. You know, we're, we're so blessed as Americans. Like we don't, we, we're all silver spoon kids. Like we really mm-hmm. are. And, and for me, it took my dad passing away in 2017 for me to really change my mindset of like, hey, life is super short and we don't have to be dickheads all the time to everybody for everything. At the end of the day, we all have our struggles. We all have our trauma. We're all just trying to do the best we can. Why not let you just enjoy it and see what happens and try our best? And when and, and the team really took that mantra on too right before that match with you guys because it, because we had just gone 0-7. We were 20th place. We're about to hit 19th place. And we're like, this could be done in two events. And we're mm-hmm. all back to whatever we're doing. And, and, and it was a fun run. So why not just have fun with it and, and try our best and see what happens? Yeah. And, I, and really, you know, when we switched that, that's when it happened. Leave it all out there, man. That's what it's all about. And then, uh, yeah, that was a wake up call for us in that Philly event as well. Um, yeah. Then you guys kicked everyone's ass. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was a good one. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, paintball is just so much damn fun, man. And I know all the listeners out there could agree no matter what, you know, it's definitely something every time we step on the field, we're trying to win. We're trying to win, you know, trying to go down the side of the field, trying to communicate. We're trying to be the best teammates we can be. Everybody's trying to win, but we're also fortunate to even be able to play this crazy game where we run around on this field with these little gelatin capsules and get to be, you know, essentially like grown kids running around, having a really good time as well. Um, it's, it's one of the greatest experiences ever. We have a saying, so our, our Dorito player, Sam Silberg, who's a, a super cool, but strange, strange kid. Um, he just, he has this saying, he's like, we're out here. This is nerd shit. Like this is really, <laughs> so at, at our practice, right? We practiced before the event. It was heat Latin saints and us, him and, uh, J rab and a rod got in a little tussle. And Sam is literally just standing in the middle of the field. Hold on. What happened? What, what, no, what there was just, you know, the practice drama, right? But mm-hmm. he's just standing in the middle of the field, taking paintballs to the throat, like, and Oof. just staring a and J and J rab down. And then yeah. they're just like talking, you know, whatever. And Sam's just like, this is nerd shit, man. I don't care. <laughs> Shoot as many times as you want. And it's fun, man. It, you're right. It's the most fun game ever. Like, and it, but it mm-hmm. is, it's just, we're, we're running around in the woods and having a good time. And I mean, yeah. you guys are obviously at the pinnacle of this game and it's just, it, yeah, I'm super blessed that we all get to do this for fun. Yeah. I was just t- at the WCPPL talking to with uh, some players about this, like, you know, no matter they ask me, you know, what's your favorite format, uh, you know, and something like that. And I was like, I don't care what you're doing. As long as you're out there shooting a paintball gun and running around and having fun, that's a win. That's a win for the sport. Um, and major shout out to the pump players out there. You know, there's a whole pump scene as well. I was chatting with uh, Tyler North. Shout out to the pump players in the uh, in the world out there. And he actually wants to take on Blake Yarber. So just <laughs> let the world let the world know that real quick. Blake, uh, Tyler wants to play you in a one on one. For all the marbles. Get um, um, so yeah, whatever you're doing, if you're out there having fun, playing paintball, enjoying yourself, it's such a great thing for the community and for your health on so many levels. It's just, uh, it's one of the best things ever. And all three of us here, we get to, you know, travel with amazing teams, amazing people. And really, we're the luckiest people ever, man. Truly. Facts. Just, yeah, man. And And the more we can give back to the world and help in any way, you know, like... That's what our sport needs to do because it's changed all of our lives sitting here. And I know for a tremendous amount of people listening in right now. 100%. Yeah. I think that's what creates uh, such a bond amongst paintball players too. You know, uh, sometimes there's the drama on the field, but as soon as you get off the field or if you're in an airport and you see another, you know, a, no matter what team they're on, you know, or if you're heading to a paintball tournament, and you see a gear bag, it's like there's this instant connection because uh, the sport is so unique. And uh, it definitely has helped a lot of people in a lot of different situations. We get messages all the time of how how the sport of paintball has helped them, you know, overcome certain adversities. And I know certainly I'm sure for each of us here can probably say the same thing, you know, whatever it might be. 
um, the game is is really a special thing for sure. Mm-hmm. 100%. How, how did Columbus LVL start? What's the story, like the backstory, the beginning of that whole movement? And kind of walk us through the early years. And then obviously, um, you can bring it into the current. We pretty much know the story. You guys are you know, doing good and having fun and right where you need to be, which is really cool to see. And we actually practiced you guys out there um, in Florida before the event, the last event, Sunshine, out at Tiki's. Major love to Tiki's paintball out there. And that is a great field. And you guys were looking sharp out there. And we were all, you know, running around and having some fun too. Yeah, I mean, you guys you guys put it on us pretty hard. And honestly, credit to you guys and Sarge and Todd for really showing us a little bit of the ropes of how that field really needed to be played. I mean, Mishka and Yaya were messing us up, up the middle of the field. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and, and that was really the big difference that we had to adjust going into the event was, was, you know, how are we going to play that field? Um, so I appreciate you and I, and hope you, hopefully you guys see us as a non-drama practice. Like we're just out there to, to get better, you know, every time. Yeah. There was so. no drama and you guys are amazing to practice against. Um, it was just a fun weekend. We had a great session out there with the saints, um, LVL obviously and heat. And, uh, you know, that field was really interesting. As Marcelo knows, they won the tournament. You had to punch on all three angles. You know, you had to punch the middle, punch the Dorito, punch the snake. It was just a really fast field on all three sides. Some fields just have like one or two, you know, but this one was all three. And if you weren't really throttling through all three portions at the same time, pretty much, um, someone was going to break through somewhere and mess your game up. So it it was a really cool field. Yeah, I mean, I, I felt like it was a ga- it was a field of opportunities, right? When you got a window, you had mm-hmm. to take it. And that's mm-hmm. why, like, you guys are so good, and obviously, Dynasty is so smart. And it's like when, and really, I was really worried about Mouse on that field because he is such an opportunity player that when he sees the gap, he's going to take the whole bite. And if you can't stop that, then and obviously, we didn't, you know, in the semis. But if you can't stop that, the field like that is, is crucial. But to go back to your question, so and, and granted, I joined the team in 2020, right, right before COVID. But the original team was playing out of a bunch of Division II teams called Imperial and some other old school teams up from Ohio. I guess they weren't really happy with their situation, um, and they approached Dave, who had the new hot field, and said, "Hey, would you be interested in making a semi pro team and us wearing your jerseys and representing the field and 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 being the, the face of paintball in Ohio?" And he said. Yeah, let's do it. So all the original guys started out and they joined up and they played semi-pro. Um, I think they played semi-pro for two years. In the second year, they had a second, a second, a 10th and a 14th. And, uh, you know, all the PC Katana stuff was going down in the pro leagues and uh, Die and Dave and whatever got the opportunity to get the spot. And as Marcelo said, it was Dave's dream to have a pro team. And, uh, you know, they, they said, hey, let's, let's see this. What's the worst that could happen <laughs> with, the, with the laughing stock of nerd world. Um, so like, that's kind of what it was. And, and, and then Dave called me and said, Hey, we, you know, we can't do this without a coach. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a huge advocate and, you know, no offense to any teams that don't, but I really believe in our league that if you have a coach that played professional paintball, you have a leg up on the teams that don't. Like, it's just, I really think to have that mindset and to have that knowledge um, is huge. I mean, look at SK, look at, look at Todd, you know, look at, look at Ryan brand, like the people that have played a high level just seem to get the game a little quicker and understand what's evolving on the field a little bit better. Um, that's just yeah. a, you know, a, a hot topic of mine, but anyway, Dave Baines they, as well. One of the best paintball players, I mean, arguably yeah. ever. Baines yeah. was unreal on the field back then. Um, Monster. Yeah. So, so yeah. yeah, but anyway, so, so then, then that was it. And, and they decided to go pro Dave, Dave, you know, acquired the pro spot and uh, the journey began. And uh, yeah, that's when I met the boys and, you know, we knew it wasn't going to be easy and we knew we'd have to make some changes and, you know, there's been a little bit of roster changes and whatnot, but all, overall it's still pretty much the same guys that started. Um, we've had to, you know, we've had to get down a little bit in our numbers wise, cause there was like 12 kids when I started it. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, but yeah, and then we made one pickup out of uh, Colorado, Corwin, um, who's a who's a really good player out of the Colorado Blitz program. Shout out to the Colorado players. There we um, go. And uh, and yeah, he joined last year and, and then the rest is history. Nice. And that that's so huge for the hub center. Like we think of it as like hubs. You know, we have your East Coast, West Coast, your Florida, uh, Texas paintball. Arizona is really doing well. And we need hub centers like that like your guys's hub center is really booming how is the uh the paintball scene looking out there in ohio these days 
Dude, it's it's incredible. You know, so I grew up in Chicago, right? I actually am from Chicago, so I grew up in the in the Badlands camp, right? Yeah. Gritty, Jeremy oh, Soule, uh, Mike Bruno, <laughs> those guys. Those guys used to beat me down every weekend. No way, and, I did not know that. Oh yeah, so yeah, yeah, I grew up with all those guys. Like played against Voltage, played with Damian Ryan on ninety three yeah. Bulls. That was all my crew. What? Um, and then I and then I moved to Tennessee for college. I went to University of Tennessee, and that's how I met the CEP guys. Um, but like once aftershock kind of started to disband a little bit Midwest paintball didn't have many, there, there wasn't yeah. much. Going on, right. So that was tough. And now I feel like finally there's a resurgence and there's a little bit. So I know there's a good scene going on in Michigan with the TPC guys now, and there's the, the new distortion team back in semi pro, but at level dude, it's insane. Like literally Dave will text me and he'll be like, dude, I just sold two skids of practice paint on the, on the turf fields. Like, and Dave also has built such an awesome facility. I mean, we have two perfectly graded turf oh, fields yeah. with air in the pits. We, we have, we have the, the coaching things above the field so I can watch over the top and see what they're all doing at the same time. I mean, yeah. we have a really good setup. And, and so he, you know, it's almost like the field of dreams, right? If you build it, they'll come. Um, yeah. And, 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 and then the team success combined with that, I, I just, man, I don't see level not being packed with tourney players every weekend. Mm -hmm. Do you guys, um, film practices do you do you watch film of your guys self playing people or anything like that not as much as we should uh i really i started doing it a little bit in our practice we've done it a little bit with gopros at at, at the field at home you know i think it's a lot of times it's a staff thing like you need that extra mm -hmm. body right and then yeah. you need to be able to cut it up sometimes um but i do i i really do think that if players just like golf if players film their play they'd really find their errors faster than they do now like we have a snake player, our second snake player, Justin Politi, who crushed it in uh, in Florida last weekend. Had had the tournament, best tournament he's ever played. And and at practice, there was times I was I was filming him because he slows down when he runs to where he's going. I'm like, dude, when you slow, that's where you get clipped every mm -hmm. time. Like we got a full send, you know. So, but being able for him to watch it versus me tell him, yeah, completely different ball games. You know? Absolutely. So I, I, we don't do as much as we should, but I, I'm hoping we can incorporate it more this year. Watching film of yourself is the most crucial thing in getting better, in my opinion. I mean, it's, it's imperative because when you actually see it with your own two eyes, something registers differently. You know, you, you truly understand to the fullest what mistake you're making. Whereas if people are just telling you about it, you don't feel that way. So it's hard to, it's really hard to change. You can't see it. You know, it's hard to have a third, third party perspective on yourself without the film. Mm -hmm. Film is I mean, so crucial. There's a reason that every professional sport team has a crew of film analysts that play that stuff back. And I, and I don't know, you guys might know better than I, but didn't at one point the Russians literally film every movement on the field? <laughs> yeah, they, they, uh, they, they, well, yeah. actually, no, they don't have their, their camera guy since COVID. He hasn't, yeah, right. he has not I miss him, here, man. But, yeah. yeah, but they used to like do everything. I remember oh, yeah. playing against them, and I'm like, these guys are literally breaking down every single snapshot and form and everything. And I'm like, that's a whole nother level. Sheesh, you ain't lying. That the, what the Russian Legion was doing at the time they were doing it compar comparatively to the paintball scene was just astronomically further ahead than anyone else at the time. Well, that's the only way they were going to, you know, catch up, right? That's the only way because they only got to see the top level teams five yeah. times a year. Mm -hmm. You know, other than that, they were, you know, the timeline, their timeline of paintball was was further back than ours. So they they were the ones who just really took fundamentals and ran with it yeah. and and did all of the things like a professional organization to catch up, you know, and obviously it worked. Oh, yeah. Yeah, major shout out to those guys and you know we had a little drama with them at the event with with krill and everything but i have nothing but respect for those guys and the, the fact that they can just come over here that many times and take so much time away from family and kids and like i mean they're on the other side of the world to play a, a silly sport like shout out to those guys like uh nothing but love to to them and that was the first time i'd actually ever beaten them in anything um so i was that was that was huge i, I was stoked about that that was crazy. You you got to let's just dive into that. Walk us through what was going on during the event. Obviously, rolling into Sunday. How are you guys feeling um going into that Sunday morning? So, I took it as as logically as possible. And I, and I'll and I'll and I'll kind of play out how it went. I knew that they had five guys. 
Mm-hmm. And they don't, if there's one thing that they don't do is they don't switch up their, their, their people, especially this event. They had Smotrov crushing the snake. They had Malloy behind him. They had Krill up the middle. They had Sergey on that far side Doritos in the back, kind of peeking his head around. And then they had, um, uh, who's their front a Dorito player. I can't remember. Uh, car, cars live. Cars live. Yeah. They had cars live there. So we had a team meeting the night before and I said, boys, we're playing X ball. They got five guys. We know exactly what they're going to do. I've scouted every game they've played. I know every thing they're doing. They know that they're a superior gun skill team. They're going to play that game. And they did. And and then, so, and here was my theory. And I'm interested you guys see your guys' take. And I said, five guys, two minutes between points, no split deck. I need you to shoot guns and hoppers and packs and goggles. 100%. So I said, I, and I said, when they're coming off the field, I said, I like those guys and they're another die team, but shoot the shit out of their guns, packs and, and, and uh, goggles. And we did, and it started to wear on them. And, and, and then obviously the match went back and forth and you could see them getting tired. You could literally see them getting tired as the match went on. Cause they went up early. They were up three on us. And I was like, we just got to bend and not break. And we had a couple crucial kills and a couple crucial points that came down because we knew what they were going to do literally knew what Smotrov was going to do he because he, he they, they just had the same consistency so so we kind of just played off that we took advantage of the shots and and it was a huge win for us as a level of the program you know krill came up to me afterwards and, and 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 said that he's never been overshot like that his entire career and it wasn't appropriate it was dishonorable and he wasn't he wasn't appreciative of the win and i said and, and i and i asked him i said hey krill why do you think we did that and, and he brought up the whole political thing that's going on in the world right now. And I think that's important because I, I don't care about any of that. Like what's going on between two other countries is their business. And, and I support, you know, freedom for all and all that kind of good stuff. But the fact that he thought that about us, it, 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 it not so much hurt my feelings, but I just don't want him to think that about Columbus level. Right? I don't want any team to think that, that we have any ill intention about anything. I, I told him, I said, dude, I'm here to win. I am paid to win and I am paid to get these guys to win. And our, you know, everything revolves around that. So I did the logical thing, which was use the advantage of the clock and you guys getting clean in the pits without a, without a pit staff and having five guys. And I apologize if you took it the wrong way and still to those guys, I'd really do. I don't want them to think that because I don't care anything about politics, but I was in it to win. And that was our strategy. We knew what they were going to do. We knew we had to, they, we knew they were going to come out hard against us. And we tried to play smart and we knew if we did that, they'd get frustrated and eventually start to get tired. And that's literally what happened. And we pulled it out with whatever, 30 seconds left. Yeah, that was a crazy game. So did you guys going into that match, you you wanted to run a lot of points. You want games to be kind of fast. You want to send it and, you know, let the chips fall where they may. No, honestly, that's what naturally always happens in our games. But I am such a, I still to this day know that analytically, if we give a team that's top five in the world more points to play, we're going to lose more than we're going to win. Yeah. Like statistically, that's what it would be. Like if I play you guys, I'm like, nope, I want a two to one grinder. Like, let's go. And and let's, let's get a shot in that we need at some point to swing the momentum. Right. So I didn't do, I didn't want that. And even actually the, the second point, I ran the clock down. I let them sit out there for an extra 45 seconds. So my guys could get turned knowing they had four guys standing on the field. So I ran it down. They all stood out there. I ran it down. And then, and then my guys were ready to go at one minute and their guys are running on the field at 20 seconds. Yeah. So it was just, you know, I, it, it, they, it played out that way, but I really wanted like with X ball, when we moved to no split deck for the, for the finals, I really, dude, there's not a single player on my team that's played no split deck. They didn't even know. What, they didn't even know. So I'm like, guys, when you get shot, get off the field. Yeah. Hustle you, back. Hustle yeah. back. No, they're like walking around like there's a point going on the next. Like, you know, I'm like, guys, no. Like, so, so I had to really command that side of the game and be like, okay, what? Cause I, cause when we, when I played pro, there was no split deck. So it was just, yeah. you know, you knew it. Um, so yeah, so that was how that match went down. They did exactly what we thought they were going to do. We got a couple key shots in when we needed to, to mm-hmm. turn some points to get us the win. Um, we played logically. I did play it on in the gray with that, with the, with the stuff, cause I knew that they had to take time in the pits and, and turn it around. Um, but with that said, because I did feel bad, and I want them to know, and I want other players to know, like there was yeah, no ill intention. It was there. Love. And you guys are out there to play the best paintball game you can. Um, that's some really good intel, though, for the listeners out there. Is If you're playing a team that's way better than you, 
you do not want to play, you know, a ton of points. The team that you're playing definitely does. You know, they want to kind of uh, most of the time the mantra is to lose fast, win slow. You know, that's that's how the best teams do it. And it's definitely important to remember who you're playing and kind of play. You know, you want a nice long point and a couple long points that you can draw out, shoot paint. You know, maybe like you said, make a couple great shots and get the upper hand on a team that may be better than you. Yeah, and you know, we ended up. I know, I know, everyone voted the same way with the potential rule change in the off season. But my argument was, as a lower team, I don't really want the top teams to be able to blow the whistle if we get a quick point in on them because it's it's statistically not as good for us to let them turn around real quick and get Archie back on the field. Like, I don't want that. Why would I want, why would I want you go? Why would I want heat five up right away again? Like, I don't want that. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I can see it both ways, but, but yeah, I mean, you know, when, when you got to know what you're up against and, you know, we're still a a young team that's growing and, and, you know, that part of the game is, is, is critical. What do you think about the shot clock? We, we came up with this thing we were talking about on one of the episodes where, um, instead of being able to like throw in the towel immediately, you can hit like a shot clock and it's like, all right, you got, you got 24 seconds to win the point or lose the point, you know? And then the game just kind of goes crazy at that point. Dude, I love, I love anything that creates us more to be like NBA jam, like the three, you know, the six point. <laughs> yeah. Like what if, what if one player from each, like what if each player had one different color paintball? And if it gets, if you hit someone with that one, oh, you, two players are gone. Like, boom. You know, <laughs> yeah, like, all that stuff that makes it better for viewers, I'm all Marcelo, about. Marcelo is going to put those color ones in his pocket and drop them in there. You know, he's going to. Yeah, he's always got that something like that going on. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll keep the, what color would those be? Yellow? Yeah. <laughs> let's, talk, let's, talk about, let's talk about the band colors, actually. Oh. <laughs> I'm just super sour because. I've been watching Impact play for like five seasons with all gold jerseys. Yep. <laughs> and I finally wear a gold frame that I've seen in the league before. And I got so much shit from the refs about it. Gold's Dude, allowed, is it not? I think gold's allowed. Sometimes those infamous jerseys get pretty yellow. If you yeah, I know. That's what I'm saying. Like white jerseys should not be allowed. No, yeah. I mean, yeah. White I don't jerseys know. should not be allowed because as soon as you get shot, they're stained. And it's like... It's that it you wipe it off and it still has the, a hit there essentially. Dude. And so if another hit hits the same spot, you're not seeing it. I'm almost positive that Harrison Fry tells his pit crew <laughs> not to touch him in between points. Because, <laughs> dude, that guy is the squirreliest. And I'm like, I, I, it amazes me. Like, I actually am so impressed by him because I'm like, he. I've seen that guy get shot more times and not get called out. And it's, it's that. It's got to be the white jersey. It's effect. crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah, I love it. But no, I mean, I don't know, man. Yeah, it is it is nuts. And then you get cleats involved and it's uh, it's like, you know, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, actually, um, you can expect to see Houston Heat in the brand newest jerseys will be that color yellow. The infamous yellow is what we're calling it. <laughs> we're we're going to be rolling out there here pretty shortly. Dude, Are you I guys going to rock them? Absolutely. Are you kidding me? Yee! Hot buzz. What is, what is the current rule? Is it just yellow's band? It's called yellow. infamous yellow. Anybody can use it and it's up for grabs. Yeah. Get in there. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, but the current rule is is yellow, no yellow. This isn't yellow though. This is infamous yellow. It's different. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Infamous so are yellow. technically our Archie's goggles, are they technically not allowed? So there's another Ooh. thing with the goggles, and that's that it's not by like a two inch by two inch radius. Uh. Or I think the other rule with goggles is it has to be like 10%, uh, can't be more than 10% of the goggle. And honestly, I don't know that the frames are more than 10%, to be honest. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, yeah, it's that's all the gray area stuff. I, I don't pay, really pay attention to too much. I, you know, it, I get it and it, it, it sways it sometimes, but I'm always like, uh, I tell my guys, I'm like, if you didn't like it, you should have shot them more, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> there you go. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. That's the same thing with like, uh, you know, when people are like, man, the ref got me or whatever. It's like, no, well, let's play better. We should, we should play so good that a ref never even has an opportunity to like affect the win. You know, if we play that good, a ref doesn't have an, a chance. To, yeah. You know, and that's on, that's on us as all players as well to, you know, play the best we can. I'm like the first one too to get on refs and I always apologize to them afterwards. But like, like we had, a, we had two pretty bad penalties in the Latin Saints game and one was like pretty, 
I know my player didn't intend to cheat, but like legit, Jason showed it to me, Trozen showed it to me, and I'm like, oh yeah, that's pretty bad. I was <laughs> in your I was in your pit. Yeah, you kind of like you kind of like went off at first. Of course, you got to stand up right. for your player, right. and then afterwards, like, sorry, Jason. Yep, yep. That yeah. you're like you were you verbatim. Actually, you were like, I still don't think you did it on purpose, but that was. <laughs> 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 yeah. I was like very diplomatic, Robbie. He definitely did it on purpose. <laughs> yeah, that was that was a tough one. So so I mean, and, yeah, and then you look back at the match, and you're like, well, those are the things we point at, like. With those are the reasons we lost. It wasn't because one player slid something off because they're doing mm-hmm. everyone's doing it all tournament long, you know? Mm. Yeah. So, but yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about that Saint game a little bit. Um, because, yeah, to me, it's it's that penalty is a big one. You know, you go, it, you essentially lose two points on that. You know, uh, you lose the first point, then you have to start down on a, a body. It's really hard to come back against an experienced team. I'm obviously, I know the Saints are a new organization, but the players and that group of players have played together for a long time. Yeah, I mean, you know that. Yeah, and that's it's. I know the guys went back and watched that match over and over, and and they'll feel the same way. And. Yeah, you can't give those teams an inch, right? And we brought it back after that. We brought it back to 4-4, and then it would just you, the shots that we needed to happen didn't happen. And I think it's just another another testament that, you know, that it's just another level on Sunday, right? It goes up and up, and every round gets harder and harder. And, I mean, yeah, credit to those guys. And, and we practiced them, right? We, it was us, Heat, and Saints the weekend before at Tiki's. So we knew what A-Rod was doing in the middle. We knew what Mouse and Spica were going to do. Um, you know, our whole strategy was – it's pretty dumb to try to stop mouse, right? Like he's going to mouse is going to eat 99% of his paintball career. So our strategy was if we can get Silos out of the Doritos, we knew Spica wasn't too aggressive after him. So if we could get Silos out of the Doritos, we could start to turn the field on them. And if you go back and watch the points we won, that's literally what we did. We let Mouse come down the snake. We'd get out to the corner to stop him. A couple of times we caught him, a couple of times we didn't. But then we turned the field Dorito side. But credit to Silos because he would – he knew I'd call – we had a code to call in the box, and he would trick me three out of four times and line up and do something different. So, um, you know, that was our strategy going in. Knew what A-Rod was going to do at the middle, right? He's going to get he's gonna get his up there. So our goal was get Silos out of the Doritos – trade with A-Rod in the middle and close the field around the D side. And, uh, you know, the points we won, we did it pretty well, but it just, you know, they had, they had the answer a lot of times for us. Yeah. I mean, that team is full of weapons. They have, they have a lot of different ways that they could attack you close. Uh, they, uh, they definitely are only going to get better. Um, you know, and they just got a second, second place at the first event. I know for them that that seems ahead of schedule, but, um, just so many different ways. And, you know, if Silos continues to play like that, that's huge for them as well. Um, because he's kind of like an un, uncovered gem right now. You know, uh, he had a great, great season with the Ironman last year, but didn't get a lot of opportunity. Um, when he did, he played really well. And uh, now on this team, it looks like he might be able to just, you know, be let off the leash. And he's, he's only gotten better. He's super hungry too. Um, but that's that's a wise strategy. I know we've definitely had that conversation, Ty. You remember, obviously, you were on the team back in 2017 when we played Impact in the finals yep. uh, at World Cup. And it was like one of those situations where Mouse was digging out to a corner that was kind of hard to get to. Um, and if he got there, he would pretty much win majority of the points from that spot. And so we put so much focus on shooting him on the break going to that corner that it ended up hurting us in many other areas. And And then we still didn't even shoot him or when we did shoot him, we didn't shoot him. That makes sense. You know, like he mouse was in the corner period. He was in the damn corner and turning the field on us. And it's, it's kind of wise to sometimes say, you know what? All right. We're not going to put as much focus on that. We're just not going to let him completely uh, dominate this side or, or shoot everybody in the first minute. We're going to try to win from somewhere else, you know, and, and turn the field on him. That's a, that's a very wise strategy for sure. I mean, yeah, I, we, we just played it out. I'm like, I got a kid from Grove City, Ohio, and a kid from Denver, Colorado, going up against Jay Reb and Mouse on the snake side. Like, let's be smart here. Let's, you know, pick our battles we can. Um, but, uh, but yeah, they, ended up, they just played better. We had a couple penalties, like you said, that, that hurt us. And, uh, you know, it's not a blessing. It's a lesson, right? Absolutely. Yeah. What was the score, the final score on that? It ended up being 7-4. Mm-hmm. It was five to four it was four to four with three minutes left and it was five to four with a minute 30 left i think yeah so i mean it was it was tight we we were down 3-0 then brought it back and tied up 4-4 four, four, 
Um, and then they end up getting some, and I think the last two points, like we literally, we were just running, you know, you just run down the yeah. field. Yeah. Um, and I think, well, yeah, so it was, it was, it was tight though. I mean, we, we, there was a couple little things that could have gone our way that I, I really think, you know, and that's like, man, the top games in the world, you guys know this, like the difference in ninth place and first place is, is, is two balls sometimes. Yeah. You're not lying, Absolutely. man. It's, the margins are razor thin. <laughs> When I see people like hate on teams that take a seventh or whatever, like when you guys get knocked out in the round of four, I'm like, yeah, but did you watch? Like if two points play out differently, they're going to win this tournament. Like it's just so, which is why it's so impressive that Marcella, you guys have done what you guys have done. Cause it's like, you have to be on every second of every match in this league specifically. I think it's the most competitive it's ever been. Um, and like to fact to, to, to win three straight, I think that's what you guys have done. Right. Yeah. Like that's, that's stupid. It, it seems surreal, to be honest. It's it's strange. Uh, just chalk it up to Dynasty Magic. I know we say it a lot, but you're right. The league is more competitive than it's ever been. Um, and and any team from top to bottom can beat almost any team. And you're right. Like, these margins are razor thin. And even in, in our wins, there's, like, so many matches. Even on Sunday, you could go back to where it's like, if that one point went the other way, where this whole conversation's different. This Everything's different. You know, if that – if the – the one this, the one that yep. goes differently, you know, uh, we're in a completely different position. Sometimes it really is just a little bit of luck, you know, a little bit of luck, a um, little bit of skill, a little bit of timing. And uh, it all goes into that. That's that that magic soup, you know, um, someone was telling me like, someone was telling me they're like, oh, yeah, DMG is so rough. Like they're relegated 100 percent. I'm like, if you're going to sleep on Shane, how you are freaking crazy. <laughs> like, <laughs> Shane the yeah. chain. I was like, dude, that dude, if, if that dude went down to semi pro, he'd shoot four to five guys a point every point. Like, no doubt, like in my mind. Guaranteed. Um, He's you know, a it's beast. just, yeah, it's yeah. just, it's, it's so tight. I, I was, there's obviously only one team went on for DMG. Every other team won a match. And like, you look at some of the lower teams, and there was teams down there that made Sunday last year. Like, you know, it's, it's crazy how tight it is. And, and I think, and then you see like Hurricanes come up and get a good win their first one. And then they, I think the last three matches, they kind of realize, oh, this is a, this is a tough one, right? This league is tough. Mm-hmm. And I think every match literally this year, I think we'll see it this year. It's going to be, it's going to be wild who, you know, the teams that perform. Yeah, it's, it is. It's so competitive and you have to be on, like we just said, every moment, every second, you have to be on sharp, like dialed in, know the process, know the procedure that we're taking um, because there's those five, you know, we got those five wheels essentially spinning out there. And we got to make sure they're all rolling in the right direction. Absolutely. Yeah. We had one of our newer kids. We have a young kid that we brought up from a D2 team last year. Let him learn a little bit. He actually played lights out against the Saints. He's, they call him the Brown Beanie Bandit. His the, brown, is the yeah. Brown Beanie Bandit. <laughs> That's what Maddie was calling him up in the booth. And uh, and he Good just man. got he got wild up in the center. And there was a point early in the tournament where like he was posted on the S2 or on a cross shot. And then one of the guys came three, you know, three steps up and just obliterated him. And I'm like, what did you think was going to happen? You thought he was just going to sit there and sit there and sit there. I'm like, no, like this is the league. Like they're, they're 10 steps ahead. Every opportunity. Like it's man, it's crazy. It is fun to watch. And I'm like, I'm like, I think about it. I'm like, man, I'm way too slow to play in this league nowadays because it is y'all are moving out there. Yeah. The athleticism in the game has really, uh, turned into a truly professional sport, right? And that's a, it's a cool thing to see. You're seeing, you know, I'm, I'm watching, uh, I was coaching out at the WCPPL this weekend. I've got a kid on the team, another, you know, Ben Slofer. Oh yeah. Um, I got my eye on him, don't worry. <laughs> Good luck. Um, <laughs> he, you know, I'm watching him and his athleticism and I'm just like, man, it's, it's unbelievable what these kids are able to do, you yeah. know, and the way they can maneuver around the field. We're like, we're lucky because we still kind of get away with it because there's not a bunch of those kind of athletes that have the wisdom that we have in the game. So we still get away with it, but there's going to be a time that comes to where if you don't have that type of athleticism, just like you did in every other sport, then you won't cut it in, in paintball. It might take longer because the gun is a little bit of an equalizer, but the, the reality of it is if you are that, that athletic, I mean, it just creates separation from the next player, you know? I mean, yeah, the ability to get out to corners, to get up the middle and not be seen and that stuff, it, it, it is crazy. And you're right. Like it's still the, the good old boys club of wisdom, but, but we're seeing it with, 
level taking third place their, in their third year of pro. Like that wouldn't have happened five years ago, right? It was the, the mind is still the, the greatest strength on the paintball field, but and in the way that the fields are developing, right, with so many bunkers and so many places to get lost, these young, fast kids can get lost, get a couple kills, and completely change a match. Yeah, agreed. And that's that's what we're trying to do, like literally, like 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 you know, use that. But yeah, it's it's gonna be fun to see it develop. And and also a shout out to I know there's obviously they you know NXL gets a lot of stuff, but shout out to them for like creating an entire women's division. Yeah. Like, how, how dope yeah. is that? Like to see women play. Like I told Dave, I was yes. like, dude, I want to coach Ohio's women's pro team too. Like I want to, I want, and I want to go wreck the Dallas pro team in the women's division. Like <laughs> I don't even know who would be on it, but I was like, so shout out to that because you talk 100%. about pushing the game. Like it's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. WNXL is going to blow up too. There's so many ladies out there who are <laughs> going to be running around shooting paintballs. Cause once again, it's, uh, it's just such a, Great sport for literally anyone walking the planet Earth. Go out there, play some paintball. You're going to be able to connect with people around you and just really have one of the best experiences ever. And, the, you know, most parks are going to take you under their wing. They're going to show you a great time. They're going to make sure you have that great experience um, because they know how valuable it is, obviously, through all the socials and everything that we say to grow paintball and keep this thing growing strong to give that experience every time we have new players that play the game. Hundred percent, yeah, it's it's super dope. So that that's really cool. Um, I, I saw shout out to Noel Tran, Revo's coach, was up in Northeast this weekend wearing a WNXL jersey, like supporting one of his teams. And I'm like, you start to see that stuff, and you start to realize, yep. like, oh, this is a cool movement. Like, it, yes. it's dope. It's really cool. You you see a lot of the NBA players do that. You see them showing up to the WNBA games. You see them supporting it, and it really like that is kind of all it takes. You know, is is getting people to to understand and buy in. And I'm not going to lie. I enjoyed watching some of the, some of the WNXL players, you know, they, they have some talent. They really do. There's some, there's some players that can ball out there. And um, like who, who's going to be the Candace Parker, right? Who is going right, to yeah. be that? And, and then, and then who's going to be the first girl to play in our league? Yeah, exactly. Like, right? That's what I've that's been, what that's too, what I've right? been waiting for, for a long time. Cause yeah, I know there's going to be a girl who's going to just come in and kick the shit out of everybody. <laughs> It's coming, dude. I can't wait. Yeah. Oh, it's 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 definitely coming uh, again. You know, there was the European uh, chick, um, Nicholson. I, I forget her last name, but she played for yeah, yeah, Arena, yeah. and she was a stud. She was so yep. good, yep. you know. And so, like, I I mean, I know it's gonna happen. It's definitely gonna happen. Um, well, right now, well, Brittany Vang is is the one. She's the she's the champ. She's the uh, World Cup MVP. She's the the MVP of this last uh, event we just had, and so. You know, I'm excited to see what she's going to continue to do. We actually absolutely need to get her on the show, Tyler. That's a, yeah. that needs to be like a priority. Yeah, big ups to uh, Dallas Vibe winning that out there. Way to go, girls! Awesome. Hell yeah! Love it. Awesome. So, Robbie, what do you think is what do you think's next for Level? Do you think that you guys have everything necessary to win an event right now, or do you think maybe this is? making you guys a more popular destination. So maybe you can attract a free agent or what, what's, the, what's a, a little bit of the goal, if you don't mind, you know, sharing without giving away obviously too much. Yeah, no, I, you know, I think number one, our goal of this year is, um, you know, Dave, Dave wants to finish top eight and, and, you know, I had a personal goal of top 12. Dave had a goal of top eight after that first event. I think he might, you know, it, it, it's realistic, right? I haven't started running like the numbers of, from last year of the top eight teams and what we would have to do to stay in that, in that area. Um, that's kind of numerically, that's the goal for me. I just want to see consistency. I don't, right. I, we said coming into this event, I think we're the only team in the league that could get smashed by the last place team, but also smash the first place team. Like, and I don't want that. Like, I don't want to be that team that you don't know who's going to show up on the field, depending on their mindset. So I want to find consistency on the field. That's my, that is my goal because the, at the end of the day, if you find that, then you can work towards getting better every single match. Um, so I'm stoked for that. And uh, yeah, you know, I don't know roster wise. Um, I think it's always good to have weapons, but I think what we decided in this off season, when everyone was making big moves, we just said, Hey, we saw last year that if what kind of what can happen if the vibe gets a little messed up and we don't want that to happen again because we had a couple of players approach us and we had some discussions with other players that went to other teams. Um, and, and I think, uh, 
yeah, I just don't want, I don't want someone to come in and not understand how our system works and how these guys get along. Like, th- like the way, like when Tyler said, we talk about drama, there is never any drama with any of these kids. It's insane. Like they're just all best friends and they've been family for years and they're all in each other's weddings. And it's just, it's so different. Like it's, it's like that old school dynasty brotherhood. Like, right. Like, I just going to say, yeah. 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 You saw that with the iron kids and all that stuff. And like, so, so my big thing now is like, we're not going to make a move that could disrupt that. We're going to make a move of someone who would come in, um, not only help the team on the field, but also really just, you know, be a, be a Midwestern homegrown boy. If, 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 if the opportunity needs and, and now like what I've told the boys, I was like, the only reason one of our players would leave is if it's a strictly financial situation. Like that's it because you don't really have to leave. If you're going to take top four or top six in tournaments, you, you, you know, you have the skill to get there, but you know, and Dave and I have these conversations about, you know, as the team evolves is like, we can't match some of the team's budgets. We just can't, it's not possible. Every single player on our team pays for paintball hundreds of dollars a tournament, like legit writes checks to Dave for stuff. And like, and I know that's a little bit rare, you know, on, on the top level of pro, but we've, we've eclipsed that point where the best players of the bottom teams get cherry picked by the top teams. Cause they're just sick of losing. So we're not, we're past that level now. Now it's only like, we just had to fight the financial burden if someone got an offer, but I mean, we, we've literally had players after that event. I know they're riding the high of the emotions, but I've had players be like, we will never play for another team. Like that was the most fun I've ever had my entire life. We took third place. You can't replace those memories. So why mm-hmm. would I ever jeopardize that? Because we all know the grass is rarely greener anywhere. Right. So yeah, it's, it's, that's an interesting dynamic. So, you know, will we pick someone up? I don't know. You know, we're always open to it, but, but we've decided as a team that, you know, no one's going to mess with our vibe because the the boys at this point, those boys earned it. And you know, they're, we're going to ride or die with our crew. Dude, I love that. We've, yeah, I mean, I mean, we've yeah. been rooting for LVL since day one, you know, I know Marcelo and myself, uh, we always love to see teams come into the league. That's what we need. We need, fresh players we want we want this to be vibrant we want it to be alive and thriving and like when when lvl en- entered into the pro landscape we're like heck yeah man let's go guys you know and uh obviously we're not going to be telling you all of our secrets and telling you how we play or anything but always trying to like nurture the the grassroots growth the new pros and make sure that they you know you know we want to obviously win and crush them but we want them also to be strong as well, you know? I don't, I think, I think one big thing young players don't understand, you know, the one thing I hate seeing young players do is, is cheat to get to a better spot short term, right? Yeah. I think a lot of young players cheat their way to a better spot short term, but it costs them long term at being better at paintball because they're playing off hits, they're doing that kind of stuff. Of but I think one thing that I learned playing pro against you guys back then, it was you never see a pro talking shit about another pro. It's always because they don't because they understand how hard it is to get there, how hard it is to stay there and do that. I, I was always amazed at that. Like none of you guys ever gave CEP any real crap because you could see us fight and you knew that like that was happening. And and same with these guys, like all the pros respect each other. It's really fun to see. So like I, I appreciate that because like skinny Kevin, huge ambassador, huge you know mentor of mine. Uh, Sarge has helped us out in so many ways. Todd has helped us out in so many ways. Joey Blute from Damage, like when we were the, new, the the brand new pro team, he was like, "Fly your ass down here, get beat up every weekend," and we did. We literally yeah. hopped on planes at every event, and you know, so those guys to like kind of take you under your wing a little bit and help. Ryan Brandy and I used to have like late night conversations on the phone about like even after our loss, he goes, "Dude, this is exactly how I beat you." He yeah. goes, "Fix it," you know. Mm-hmm. Um, Absolutely. And I learned that from awesome. Oliver, dude. Yeah. There was a time when I was playing pro. I won. Actually, I think I won a one-on-one against you, Tyler. Went and grabbed dude, the flag, and Oliver me. was in the penalty box. Oliver was in the penalty you box. You did not. Why are you lying, bro? And you didn't win no one-on-one against Tyler. <laughs> hey, I get <laughs> shot, bro. I, <laughs> I definitely back. get shot. It's uh, yeah, no, no, no. it happens. <laughs> anyway, so 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 I came out. I, I ran the flag in, but I didn't know Oliver was in the box. He came out of the box and just blasted me a hundred times. And after the game, he pulled me aside and he goes, "Hey, you'll never do that again, will you?" And I said, "Absolutely fucking not." Like you know. So it's just those moments where the other pro teams really kind of say. And like, even now, like I can pull Mike Bianca from the hurricanes and say, Hey, like, what'd you learn? What did you see? What, like, what's going on with the team? 
it's just cool. It's, it's, you know, there's a little bit of family there too. Cause like you said, the community is so unique. Yeah. So for divisional players out there, like understand that as well. Understand that's the reality in pro paintball and try to do that same thing in the divisionals as well. You know, I know we all want to win out there. I know it's, it's cutthroat. We're playing sports and we want to, you know, be the best, but also let's uh let's also boost the environment as well and make it a growthful environment something that we can you know continue forward with in the right manner to to make it the strongest it can possibly be yeah if if we ever want this to be a sport a true sport we got to get rid of some of the stuff you see on the divisional fields and it's like i get it they're all trying to get to the highest level possible we're all trying to win but at the end of the day man it's some of that stuff that goes on at the events is like so it's just so childish. It's like, guys, come on. Like, let's, let's, let's band together as a sport here. Um, yeah, but, but I agree. I, I would, that's one of the big things that divisional players, like they got, and, and we even had our young kids like, got, like lose the attitude, learn, get better, be humble, eat the pie. And yeah. then you'll get the, you know, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And it's not all sunshine and rainbows, man. There's it's sometimes are not good, you know, and, and you got to really, uh, buckle down and be the best you can be in those moments, not just when things are going good. You know, you got to be the best when it's when things are going bad. You have to say, okay, how can I put this on my shoulders? How can I make this better? What can we do together, you know, and, and really nurture those kind of thoughts? Otherwise, you know, we're just moving in the wrong direction completely. 100%. But I, I really do feel like it's going in the right direction big time. Yes, I couldn't agree more, man. And paintball in general, pro paintball is definitely booming these days. For sure. Yeah. And it, it starts with us, right? We're, we're there. We're the pinnacle right here. The three of us here at the professional level, we're the ones that set the example for our regions, for, uh, the world, for the players that watch. Um, it's up to us to set that example. And so I think the pros have done a much better job, you know, and that's why you see paintball going in a better direction is because the pros have started to take everything a lot more seriously. Um, and the pros have, have started to really own the professionalism that comes along with being a paintball player at the highest level. So, uh, yeah, hopefully that continues, you know, cause I agree with Ty. I think we're in a great place as a, as a, as a sport, you know, I think there's a lot of eyes on the game more than, more than maybe ever. And, uh, you know, maybe Robbie, we can kind of touch on that a little bit, you know, cause again, you're so heavily involved with all these other companies. Like what, what do you think it is that has been kind of holding the sport back from getting some ma major notoriety? Like what could we be doing better? Do you have any ideas? Have you proposed anything, you know? Yeah. So, you know, actually it's interesting you say that. So Bart and I had a good conversation at, at, you know, in Florida about it and what's going on with everything and, and go sports and, and the future of that. And, and I'm excited for that, but I think paintball struggles because all the major sports in the world that are consumer sports, have a centralized object, right? A ball, usually a football, a baseball, a soccer ball, whatever. It's usually centered around that. And that's what you can track. We don't have that. You can't ever track that. Right. So, it, so I think there's a layer of com, you know, a complicatedness there. I don't even know if that's a word, um, but that's going to be tough for us to overcome. So I think we really got to dig into the storylines. And, and I think, yes, and I, I kind of talked to Bart about this is the perfect example that I can see is, what F1 has done in America, right? When Netflix released F1 Drive to Survive yeah. and, focused, and focused half on the race, but mostly on the personalities, the stories, the teams, the drivers, that and the, the struggle, that was what really brought it. The minute I watched that series, I instantly became an F1 fan. I picked my favorite drivers and I planned trips to go to races. Like that is what happened. And for us to get to that level, we need to create something that people want to watch more than just being fans of heat or dynasty or level. They need to invest in Marcelo and Tyler and, and our players and see what is like, what's the struggle here? You know, so and I, don't, I don't even know if you guys know this, but I had a TV show about my company back on network television in 2018. Dude, one hold season. on, hold, hold on. Wait, what? You had, uh, what yeah. channel, what channel were you on? Isn't this it like the on... bridesmaid one or like, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I remember this bachelor party or something. Wait, that's awesome. <laughs> what? Yeah. It was on country music television, CMT, which CMT. is like it's MTV's little sister. Yeah. Um, and uh, it was, it was essentially the, the, the Nashville version of the show below deck. If you've ever seen it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's like, mm -hmm. so, so I've been through that. We did a full season, 10 episodes, filmed 16 hours a day. I mean, I've been through that all. And that's actually the conversation Bart and I had was like, does paintball have critical mass to get the viewership to return 
our our market was always like if we didn't have a, a quarter million viewers a week, we had no shot at a second season. Like that was just it. That was the floor of that. So then you think about could our sport get a half a million people to watch every week if we did something and and to get to that level that the the Netflix, the Hulu's, the OTTs are going to want, you got to really create a story. And it's got to be more than who wins the tournament. It's got to be what like, you know, and, and even in my show, right? It was about me, it was about the girls that I employed and their stories. And dude, 30 days before my television show, my dad died. Like literally mm-hmm. tragic on my birthday yeah. in my arms, the whole thing. Completely unexpected. I'm but so that, sorry, brother. Jeez. Yeah, I appreciate that. But that's part of that's that's part of my story. And that's my yeah. life. And that's and 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 I'm not the only person that's had that type of event happen. And when you really get into that, not only do you get empathy for people and you really learn like who they are and why they tick the way they do, like the reason I'm so driven in everything I do is because I realize that we are we are finite. Yeah. We are not, you know, this does not go on forever. So if we don't take advantage of every second for the max then it's not worth doing. So that's like, that's what drives me. And it's all because of that solidary moment on my 30th birthday that my life changed forever. And if we can lean into that for all of the people in the sport and really start to develop those, like, you know, Marcel, I know you had a, had a similar thing, right? Like you and your dad were super tight and, and you have a story there. Those are the things that people get. Cause once people like attach to your heart, you have them forever. You know, the score mm-hmm. is just the score, dude. But you look at all, like, look at Jordan. Half of it is Jordan. Half of it is how Jordan played the game. Mm-hmm. You know, he was so intense. And it, it's just like, that's the stuff that I really think if we can tap into that, we have a shot. If we don't tap into that, I just don't see us getting critical mass for true viewership. It'll always be play the game. It'll always be Ghost Sports. That's great. But we only have eight. We only have 8,000 subscribers on Ghost Sports. We need 800,000. And the only way to get there is for non-paintball people to watch. Yeah. Well, I know we have the the participants to uh to document. That's not a problem. We got amazing yeah. participants to document. Dude, there's so many great stories out there. Like, you <laughs> yeah. know, people that live their lives. So look like look at Thomas Taylor is one of my least favorite people to play against just because I don't like him on the field. He's an amazing human, and that dude has given his entire life yeah. to this game. And, and I like, gotta, I gotta say, big up to Modesto because he—that's where I met Thomas out in Modesto and trained out there with that guy. He's an animal, dude. Like he, he really is. And, and so, like, so much credit to him. Like, so we just, oh, man, I just really think if that's we capture cool. those stories, we have a chance. Like, I don't know. It's interesting to say. And there's like, like you, like, yeah. It's just there's so many stories. There's so many cool things. But it's got to be more than the results of the game. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, I, you know, I've had this conversation on PTG many times, off PTG, you know, and I always bring it back to a simple thing. Everybody loves football, just about. We all love football, turning football on on Sundays, you know, playoffs, Super Bowl, it's a thing. Super Bowl is like a national holiday in America, right? When I was a kid, I hated football. My dad would every Sunday put football on and I would have to sit there and watch it with him, and I hated it. I didn't understand it. Four downs, and I saw a yellow line. I'm like, what is going on? I I just did not care for it. Guess what? Started to learn about the game, started to to love the game, started to love players. Joe Montana was my first favorite player because he was my dad's favorite player. That is what made me want to watch games. To this day, sports, basketball, I don't really have favorite teams. I have players that I'm invested in because of how they play, how they train, the type of people they are, you know, all of that kind of stuff. I can sit down and watch my favorite players all day long, but to watch two teams of nobody that I'm invested in, I I think basketball is super boring. Right. And and the game's the same. They're still making three point shots. They're still dunking. They're still cool crossovers, good passing, you know, that stuff's still happening. It's, it's just I'm not invested in the personalities that are on the floor. Yeah. It's, that, that, that tells me everything I need to know. It yep. tells me everything I need to know. And, and I think the excitement is fun. Like you, you guys chirping each other in between points and Archie doing his stuff in your guys' face. Like that, that is good for the sport. The teams having fun in the pits, the wild dog chant, our Ric Flair. Like that stuff is that stuff is good. Like that's what people want. Yeah, yo, um, shout out to your guys' uh, huddle. <laughs> Yeah. At the last event, that was wild. I just saw a clip of that on Instagram today. Where was that? On did I post it? I forgot who posted it. 
probably die. Yeah. So when I got on the team, they started doing this Ric Flair thing and, and I, I let them do their thing. And, yeah. They, and, and so we have a kid, on our team, Tyler Doyak, who is, who's that's just a great a, name, Tyler. Let's go. Super good kid. And, uh, and he knows the whole Ric Flair thing. He's like yeah. the Rolex wear and like, he gets it. And that's their thing. And it hypes up. And, and they, they, they talked about not doing it anymore because we're pro now. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, that's who we are. Like that's, that's what makes us level is because that's, you know, that's the energy we bring. And I want my pit guy to be drinking beers in the pit. I'm like, that's what you're here for, dude. Like, you know, like, so yeah, it's just, I don't know. I, I, we need to bring that emotion and those storylines into the game. And if we can, I think we really can get some people tuned in outside of, of the sport and, and, and the sport itself. Like we need, you know, I heard a great idea that everyone that has an ID card gets a go sports subscription for the year. That's a pretty sweet idea. Like, that's that's 50,000 subscribers right there. Like that's a number that if, if our true story is to go to Hulu or another OTT network, that's a number like they, we need that stuff to happen. Um, you know, and then just promoting the sport, like promoting the content. The cool thing is Go Sports essentially has the history of modern paintball on, on video. Like that's pretty wicked to think about, like over the years, like I would pay to go back and get all the CEPs old matches now that I'm like, whatever. And I'm like, yeah, that'd be just fun to have and chop up and use on social media. Like I'm yeah. probably going to go back and look up that one-on-one -on -one I shot Tyler for sure. Yeah. And, uh, and, and Dude, post turn that it, into but, an NFT and save it forever. That's it. Or sell it for 20 bucks. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I can't wait to see what happens, but I think- I don't know. That's like one of the rarest things you could have. So right? it might be worth a little more than 20 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't think anyone cares about my shit, but-, uh, Dude, but uh, I'll buy but it. Yeah. Uh, Rainy shot That's me right. in one of these other NFTs and I bought that just so Rainy couldn't have it. Sorry, Rainy. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. I just saw Rainy this weekend. Love that dude. Um, we, paintball is so much fun, man. And a lot of people out there from the outside, they see all these, what they think are rivalries or like these things going on that, that, you know, oh, these players must hate each other or, you know, this, that, and the other. And really, it's really not like that. You know, when we, but it also is like that a little bit. There are but it's some, like both. There, it's like on and off the field. It's like two yeah. separate things going on, you know? Exactly. Yeah. And it is to an extent, but, I mean, when it all comes down to it, I want to strangle Rainy on the field. <laughs> <laughs> I love him off the field at WCPP. I just had a great conversation with him again. Like I always have good conversations with Rainy. Yeah, he's my he's a good friend. I've known him for fifteen longer. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, eighteen years about. You know, on the field though, I would like to strangle him. You know, <laughs> and and I'm sure it's mutual. But there's like a lot of those kind of situations out there. You know, yeah. where it's like on the field, there's real rivalries. There's people that I I'm like can respect and I'm friends with off, off you know, mm -hmm. off that paintball field, but on the field, I don't want to see you win. I don't want to see you succeed. Yeah. I want to yeah. crush you. And mm -hmm. like, I don't really like you out there. Yeah. No, yeah. that is and real. So, and you have to, sports that's rivals, why, man. that's why, I mean, how do you think Jordan processed information on the basketball court? He's trying to, trying to devour you, you know, like there's no other option. So if you're not seeing your opponent that way, you're at a major disadvantage, but at the in the same token you know like we don't have the kind of beef i think that people think we have i guess is what my point yeah was. that's fair i think they're like oh wait until the handshake oh that was actually yeah. a thing uh <laughs> it was in the infamous saints game everybody's like oh wait till the handshake i'm like nothing's gonna happen i promise you nothing's gonna happen at the handshake i promise yeah. you guys and we're because it's like being professional you know we're yeah. we're professional athletes and we're going to treat the game professionally um you know, I don't expect, you know, anybody to be throwing knuckles at a fast food restaurant or at your local <laughs> office, you know, like we got to be professional, you know, but in the same token, things get out of hand sometimes and start going crazy. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's just a, it's a blessing. We're so fortunate to be able to just have these relationships, these uh, experiences, um, just like Robbie was talking about, because they are truly timeless. 100%. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I can. Sorry, go ahead, Marshy. Yeah, uh, I was just gonna say, I know, I know, Robbie. One, it's really late. You have a big meeting in the morning. Um, we do have some questions from the Discord. So, Ty, if you don't mind, can we can we hop into the Discord questions? Did you have anything else for him before yes, we do that? I just, I just want to boost what he's doing in his entrepreneurial life because he's got <laughs> a media company, he's got a philanthropy uh, company, a travel website. You've got a lot of things going on. So, everybody out there, go follow uh, at Hustle Media at rocket experiences and at 
Bach Weekends, B-A-C-H <laughs> Weekends, and uh, and show some love for those sites because he's doing a lot. And also, can you can you give the listeners your Instagram information so that they have that as well? Yeah, for sure. At Robbie Goldsmith, R-O-B-B-I-E, G-O-L-D-S-M-I-T-H. And uh, yeah, my big ass for the paintball community is going to be uh, releasing a whiskey the end of June. So when it comes out in your state, your local grocery store, please pick up a bottle. Yes, Bro, sir. I, whiskey is like what it it is my favorite liquor, favorite alcohol. Um, little, little, little brown water. Oh, oh yeah, goodness. little brown water. That's I good love stuff. it. So if it is in a grocery store here, I will uh, I will get some and and I'll have it on the show. I'm gonna I'm gonna have it for all the all the teams at probably. Uh, I'm trying. So it's tough for me though, and this is you know is gonna be tough because of our schedule, and we have 16 arena stadium shows that we're playing this year, and we're the main sponsor of his tour. Um, so oh wow, for Alan I Jackson. Will- yeah, I mean, we're going to wow. be, I'll be in Anaheim, we'll be in Phoenix, we'll do all of it. Like, and we're 15,000 people a show. You got to tell me when you come to Phoenix. Uh, September 30th, I'll set you up. Okay, yeah, let's meet up. Let's hang yeah. out. Yeah, so so we'll, we'll obviously, we're presenting the, the whole tour. We're running the VIP backstage. And we, you know, so we have to do this whole thing. So there will be a couple events that you might not see me at this year, which is just going to be a thing that, you know, we'll, we'll prepare for and, and we'll, we'll handle, but it, like, you know, like you guys know, at the end of the day, there's real life comes first, right? Like it's, it's, it is what it is. And, and I'm, I'm blessed with that success, but yeah, it's going to be called silver belly whiskey. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be a crazy year, but I'll, but I'm going to bring some, awesome. I'm not sure which event, but I'm going to bring a bunch of, uh, brown water for the boys. Yeah. Everybody's going to have yeah. silver bellies. It's going to be a silver belly nation. That's it. <clears throat> That's awesome. amazing. All righty. Let's, uh, let's hop into the Discord for a few of these questions. Yes, sir. Yeah, the PTG Discord is popping. We got a bunch of questions for you. And um, for everybody who does become a member, you get to vote. So we, we choose the ones that have the most votes. Everybody leaves their uh, questions in there, and we pick the best ones out there for you. Yeah, and you know what? Uh, honestly, this one is kind of tough because a lot of these questions are are um, I don't want to say the obvious, but we had already talked about some of them. But yeah, um, yeah. this one here from Welshie. Hey, Robbie, you guys seem to be getting practices in with top teams. How critical has that been for getting this young team's development? That's a great question, and honestly, I was I was thinking about that after this event. It's imperative. Like it is, you learn. We we knew after that practice at Tiki's with Heat and Saints, I said, we're not going to get better looks on this field. There's not going to be outside probably playing Dynasty in the way you guys play. We're going to see every single look that we're going to see in the tournament. And for the most time, especially in the prelims, they're going to be from a little bit higher skilled players. So it really does work for a disadvantage for the teams that don't get to practice the higher teams. Like, and we're, we're so thankful that, you know, he enjoys practicing us and damage has, you know, done it before. And, and now we're getting impact before the next event. And hopefully we'll get dynasty another shot with you guys. Cause I don't think we've ever had a true practice, but yeah, it's so imperative. So like teams out there, young teams that are getting better and grinding, like go get beat down, like get beat down because the, the things you're going to learn, if you take it the right way and feed off of it, it's only going to make you so much better. Absolutely. That's amazing. <clears throat> uh, future sponsor said, it's not a question, but a statement. After all the veteran players decide to retire, LVL will be the next dynasty. That's what he says. Oh, wow. That's <laughs> a it tall. Just, oh. I, I don't know if the dragon will ever die. Yeah, man. They're, Fair. <laughs> they're, well, it's, the dragon's you know, big. The, the history, how could it ever? You know, it's no. um, It's been around it since the early 2000s, and there's just a lot of history there. That's a story the sport needs. Yeah, that's, that's you know, the Yankees, is, you know, that's like that kind of a story. Yep. Well, hopefully we can, can uh, continue, you know, to make it a good, uh, good story. All right, Bunkered Media. Favorite and least favorite team to play and why? Oof. Uh... Favorite team to play and least favorite team. Favorite team to play is damage. I say if if we have a mental rivalry, it's against damage a, because they were truly the first team to help us. And I think when we were younger, they were looking at, um, it was just like that kind of big brother, little brother thing. It really was. It was like, they realized we were just going, getting beat down. And then when we came out and beat them in Chicago, 
that it was a big, it was one of those things where it, it just changed the dynamic of, of, of our careers in paintball. And I think there's a little bit too, um, you know, and then they beat us at world cup and overtime and then we beat them now this event. So it's like, it's almost that back and forth, like, you know, and those, those guys are unreal at paintball. Chad is one of the most underrated paintball players in the, like in the history of the sport, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would say damage is probably the favorite to play just cause we get so hyped about it and least favorite to play. Um, man, probably infamous. I love Travis and I love the team and like the, what Travis has built is so impressive, yeah. but on the field, like just knowing we're going to have to go up against Thomas and Harrison and you're literally going to have to shoot them a hundred times to get them off the field. And the refs are like, just kind of cool with the gray area a little bit because of the respect thing. Like that's just when you look up to and you're like, this is going to be a grudge match. I'm not looking forward to this. Um, you know, so I, I would say that, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. There's not really too many teams that we don't like to play. Like we kind of just get down with whoever wants to get down. Hell yeah. All right. We got Steve yeah. SoCal blaze. Um, just saw him at WCPPL. Thanks for everything, Steve. Uh, he is wondering if you have like a game day routine and what that consists of or any patterns that you, you know, do for getting ready for game day. Um, and then also any, any special foods or drinks on game day. Dude, our team are psychos about what they eat and drink. Like <laughs> we have kids that won't go to fast food restaurants or like won't go to chain restaurants. We're like, oh, you want to go out? Like I'm such like an, I love an Olive Garden night. Like I'm like, let's all go to OG, get that free salad and mm-hmm. soup, you know? And no, the guys are like, no, we don't go to chain. So like, they're weird about that. They love where, their body. Where they just like they're like let's go find a local dive like place hole in the wall and get dive bar, bar. <laughs> local yeah, dive bar like, all garden's not good enough hey let's get let's get some of this yeah. that brown water yeah. it's it's wild and like they won't they won't touch gatorade but they'll drink body armor all day and like it's just stuff like that um I, i'm a big pro like the the better you eat the better your body's going to perform right like you got to yes. prepare for it um and then but for his first question i would say and it's a tip for young teams too is if if you can eliminate all the stress in the pits and pre-match by having routine, you set yourself up for a better, for a better performance. Yeah. So we have timed out, like this is the time to expect to be in the car at the field, in the pits stretched out. And we try to keep that as much as possible. And then having our pit crew with designed roles, like everyone does. But I think a lot of young teams don't have that. You see so many divisional teams running around, yeah. grabbing pods last minute, all that stuff. Like we had one match this tournament where Dave's wife, Meg had the van and the pods were in the back of the van. And I was like, well, you fucked up. You better go buy 300 <laughs> pods. And he just ran and bought a box. I'm like, but having all that stuff prepared, if you can go into a match with, with no stress, you're just going to play better. And I think younger teams, man, if they really, if they invested the extra hundred bucks to have the coolers and the, and the pods and all that stuff, mm-hmm. I just think they'd have so much of a better experience at these tournaments. We oh, preach that all the time, dude. You're so yeah. spot on. It's pivotal. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's crazy, man. The yeah, way, it people, is. people pay seven thousand exactly. dollars to play a tournament, but then they don't exactly. bring water. An extra yeah. fifty bucks a person, you can pay a pit crew. You can you can bring all the stuff. You know, come on. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I think uh, my last question is going to be here from CB2K. Um, the NXL Pro Division is has a brutal ranking system where the bottom place team after the season, 20th place, gets relegated uh, out of it to the semi-pro division and vice versa. Top semi-pro makes it the pro. You guys were on the bubble, uh, yada, yada, yada. Long story short, he's asking, what would you change or suggest as alternatives to the current relegation system? Oof. You know, I, I'm not, I wasn't a fan of champions and challengers. I do, I do think back then when we did that, the, the, the talent was super separated. Like as a player, we like playing in challengers because we could take a top four every now and then and do pretty well down there. And then we'd go up to the champions and just get, you know, crushed. Um, yeah, it's brutal. It's brutal for the last place team that gets down, but it's almost more brutal. Think about these semi-pro teams. If they mess up one time and have one bad event, they literally have zero chance at becoming a pro. And I don't know if I love that. There's so many semi-pro teams that A, have really good players and B, have great supporters and would be great ambassadors for our sport. I don't know if there's an answer. And if there was a good answer, they would have figured it out. Like the guys that run our sport are no dummies. If there was a good answer, this would happen. But it's I almost feel worse for the semi-pro teams 
than I do. I mean, look at Blast Camp. Those kids dominated last year. They beat us in that invitational event. And for the, like, you know, they beat us in the championship or whatever. Um, that, like, and they just, they didn't do that great the first event this year. So I'm like, you look at that and you're like, those kids could probably play pro if they really trained hard, but they almost have to wait an entire another year. It's crazy. Like, it's, mm-hmm. it's wild. And then now you're seeing the AC Dallas kids go down and just run show. And if they do it all for the rest of the events, they're back up. And I don't know, man. I don't know. I don't know the answer. I wish, I wish there was. What do you guys think about that? There was a pretty good idea proposed. Um, and I'm kind of on board with it. Shout out to uh, Rob from New York. He's the owner of uh, New York Wrecking Crew, divisional team that I coach out of the East Coast. And it's pretty simple. Um, each year, a semi pro team comes up. So the first year would be the only year that is a little messy. You just have to say, sorry, we're doing it an average of the last two years. So you know, 2021 is going to count towards 2022. But um, instead of it just being the bottom place team each year, it's the an average of your last two seasons. So the bottom place team of the last two seasons. Um, I think that's the most fair. You know, you look at a team like the Ironmen who got completely gutted and are in a total rebuild right now. Um, it would be a shame if they end up in last place and then lose their pro spot, a legendary franchise like that. It's been a successful franchise for over 25 years, you know, uh, has one year of a complete rebuild and then isn't a pro team anymore. I I don't think that that's fair. I don't think that's right. I don't think it's sustainable. Um, When you talk about um, semi-pro teams that are looking at this as, I don't want to say an investment, but it's why why would you want to pay, get the pro spot? Why not just sell sell your pro spot if you earn it? You know, like, why do you want to spend all the money to go do that? And then it's just, you're going to lose it at the end of the year, likely if you're a new team, you know, and you don't have the experience. Um, I think it's got to be at least two years. Tyler, what do you think? That's fair enough. I'm going to go with Marcelo's answer. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. I yeah. honestly, I don't have the answer. I really don't know. I, I think that, uh, like you said, the people who run the ship, they're really intelligent and they have their ears to the floor listening to a ton of people. Um, and I know that, you know, if if enough people talk to them about something like that, that they're going to listen and look to implement what, could, you know, and that's a very good idea from Rob out there in New York. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it's above my pay grade. <laughs> I think the, the problem we have is the easiest way to get a pro spot is to buy it. That's a problem, right? You should earn it. At the end of the day, you should is earn it. Is it though? I mean, level bought theirs. That's why I said the easiest way to get a pro spot is to buy it. Yeah, but if you can buy one, then I think that's sweet. I don't, I don't see an issue with it. If you can field a, because look, yeah. level buying a pro spot was an amazing thing for paintball in the Midwest in that region. You yeah, know the, that that field, that field, and that team is so good for the sport of paintball. So I'm glad level was able to buy buy a spot. Yeah, and then I think the only other thing I do is I really enjoyed the Astra event, and I know it's competitor to the NXL, and I know it's that stuff, but that event gave the lower level teams and the top semi-pro teams a, a, a chance to get better, to compete, to not get beat down every, every, you know, three of the four prelim matches to actually have it. And, and I think there's a way to do that where both parties are happy and make and make a good product. But I really like those hybrid events because I really think they progress that middle level pro team. And we, we saw a huge benefit out of it. Um, I know why the NXL did their things and I know competition, you know, is, is, you know, what people think about it. But I really think that those invitational events during COVID were positive for the sport of paintball. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Major love to Dimitri for, for putting that on. And that's a, that's a lot of hard work to do something like that. And we just love to see players who love paintball um, doing cool things in the sport. hundred percent. Yeah, that, that was cool. And I hope in the future, you know, the powers that be can, can figure out a way to keep it creative and keep, keep pushing the boundaries of what we do. Totally. And, you know, to be honest, I don't think it needs to be a competitor to the NXL. And I don't really think it is. I think it's a one-off novelty event, right? And we can have multiple of those. You know, I would love to see a seven-man version of that pop up. I would love to see, you know, we have 10-man with the ICC. Um, I think that that's cool. And, and you know, the the standardized league is the NXL. They're doing a great job. We're going to compete in those, but offering more opportunities for teams to go and compete in like an open class division or something you know for a cool prize package and have unique different ways to to film it i'm i'm all for that 
I, I think if there was collaboration there instead of like seeing it as a threat, I think there's ways they could help each other and, and it could be a cool thing. That takes a lot of humility to get to that point in business. It's hard, but I do think that uh, we we really enjoyed that. And, and I was very open to Tom Cole about that. I said, hey, that was great for us. We got to compete. We took a top three. It gave the guys confidence to roll into the next NXL event and perform well. So mm-hmm. yeah, hopefully in the future we see more of that. Yes, sir. 100%. We got uh, CB2K who's wondering, Robbie, would you bring back the box, the penalty box? Oh. <laughs> he, had, he had another portion of the question, but we already pretty much talked about it in the show. But he's, he's wondering, would you bring back the box? Oh, man. I, I'm, as a hockey player, I, I, I understand and respect the concept of it. It did make the game interesting, but I just – I thought, I think that the – the worst thing about the penalty box was it really could kill your match. If you were, if you found yourself in that box for whatever it was, it used to be like, what is it like four minutes at one point that you were in that fucking thing? If there, like, you know, that was like minutes. 20, 25 minute halves though. Yeah. Two, yeah and, I mean, two and five. Yeah. yeah. I did, a good team could run up so many points in that time that it almost killed it. So conceptually, and, and if we ever talked about going into TV and stuff, I think it adds a good component to the game and it would be interesting. Um, but I just didn't like what it did to a team that, you know, and, and we, we had, we had a stigma for being in the penalty box a lot. Um, but, uh, but yeah, and that's a great question. I haven't thought about the penalty box since you just brought <laughs> that up, dude. <laughs> it was, it, that's been a hot topic in the PTG chat. Um, people love talking about that penalty box and uh, they would, I think they would love to see it come back actually. <laughs> I loved, I loved just coming out of that thing gun blazing. Yeah, no it was crazy. Get torched. <laughs> I was I was here for it though. I was like chest up, let's go. <laughs> uh wild times running through those nets out of the penalty box, man. Yep. <laughs> That's awesome. Holy moly. <clears throat> well, Robbie, man, look, dude, it's been uh an hour and a half already. Again, we know you gotta get to bed, but I'm so excited that we got to have you on the show. A lot of the PTG yeah. listeners have have been asking about um someone from level, especially after we did have Panda on early on. Um, but you know, you guys have had a lot of success since then. And I think you guys are kind of like a beacon to a lot of these teams that are concerned about getting cherry picked, you know, by other, you know, the, the, the money teams per se. Um, and you guys are a great example of, of what a team can do if they stick together and believe in each other, buy into the program, buy into the system. And, um, you know, you guys really can reach the top. And I, I, you know, after a third place, I don't think it's, you know, crazy to say that you guys could win an event here. Um, you know, if, if, if things line up and you guys are playing well, Kit, you know, get hot on a Sunday. That's all it takes, right? That's it. You know, and I think, you know, I, we want to be that for teams. Like we want to give teams a, a hope to be like, hey, if we work hard and, and continue to be a team, we can, you know, anything is possible. I, I'm such an advocate in this world that like if you want something, go get it. Like mm-hmm. just go get it. It could be a girl. It could be paintball. It could be a business. It could be a trip, whatever, like go get it. And, and actually one of my last points, uh, Maddie Marshall gave me a book when I was playing for CEP came out to die. It was actually when we did that photo shoot, Marcelo with me, you, Jason Edwards. And, uh, and he gave me a book. It was called the war of art, um, by Steven Pressfield in the back of the book literally says everyone on this earth was put here for a reason. Some to be doctors and cure cancer, some to be paintball players, some to be whatever. And if you don't do the most with that, what you're given, you not only do yourself a disservice, you do the entire society a disservice. So give it what you got and take it. And that's like my biggest thing, man, is like, you know, what you want. And I just got to give a shout out to all the kids on level, like all of our guys from the pit crew to the guys who are role players to our starters, like congratulations, boys, because they earned it. They work so hard. They give up so much. And uh, Dave and I obviously set the stage and, and let it happen. But those those dudes... You know, they're going to be household names in paintball soon. And uh, and I couldn't be more happy for those guys. I love that, man. Yeah, congratulations to the LVL crew. And if you want to shout out the sponsors, show some love for them. I know that they make all the, the dreams come true for you guys. Yeah, for sure. First and foremost, uh, uh, Level Up Paintball Park in Grove City, Ohio, Dave Pando's Park. If you're ever in the Columbus, Ohio area, it's only 20 minutes from downtown. Awesome park. Um, please come see us. Uh, Die Paintball has been believer since day one. Um, amazing gear, obviously can win with it. And uh, New Balance, Falcon, paint shoots amazing. 
um, yeah, just just everyone who's made it possible, all the families that support level and uh, and and all the other pros in the league. That, that I, I think it's kind of cool. Like I, I secretly kind of think. Well, you guys talked about. It, but I secretly kind of think like people root for us, like when they're not playing us, and they're like, yeah, like like <laughs> let's go see those kids from Ohio just go out and ball out. So it's been fun to see, and, and we appreciate the support and you guys, you know, helping out too because the, we're getting better because of it. Yeah, it's all love for paintball, man. That's always the motto. And uh, we're super grateful to have had you on the show, Robbie. Thank you for stopping by. And once again, yeehaw. Good luck with the uh, with the Alan Jackson concerts and everything you have going on. And major love out there to Nashville, Tennessee. You guys stay safe out there, all right? Thanks, fellas. Appreciate it. All right, awesome, my man. Brother. Peace. Peace. All right, PTG fam, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Really hope you guys enjoyed the episode. As always, if you would like to support the show, please head over to ptgpaintball.com, click the Patreon link, and get signed up. Any level will give you access to our Discord. Discord is the coolest thing ever. I don't even need to say it anymore. You guys know Discord is super lit. Shout out to our Discord community. Shout out to young Stevie, our community manager. He's the man. He's got everything going on in there. We got all sorts of cool stuff. Giveaways, fun, you know, fitness challenges, all sorts of different film room things. It's awesome. Hope to see you guys in there. And as always, we'll see you soon.